Welcome to Environmental Fridays. It is personal season four. This season will be featuring 16 episodes with 16 guest speakers from Arizona, Barbados, Georgia, Grenada, Illinois, Massachusetts, Michigan, New Mexico, New Jersey, Ohio, Tobago, Trinidad, and the United Kingdom. Thank you to all our guest speakers. Now here's our host, Dr. Desmond Hartwell Murray. And this week's guest co-host, Alana Tahartra. And this week's guest speaker, Dr. Evie Shockley. So, uh, welcome to Environmental Fridays. It is personal. It, this is uh, season four. And today we will be doing something a bit different. To get some more information about our program, Environmental Fridays, you can visit our website, www.theenvironmentalfridays.com. Part of the reason why we um, started Environmental Fridays is written here. We had a little write-up in our Benton Spirit Community newspaper. The publisher here is online with us, Princella Tobias. It says, if your house is on fire in the middle of the night and you know it, do you keep it to yourself? Do you only tell the adults? Do you not tell the children? Do you not tell the kids uh, or the Navajo, the black kids or the Navajo kids or the Caribbean kids? Do you um, wake them up? This is what Environmental Fridays is all about, telling the truth as the late Jamaican singer Bob Marley sang, tell the children the truth. Our environmental truths, our climate crisis truths, our environmental justice truths. It's about bringing actionable awareness. So uh, next week we will have um, a speaker from Tobago, Lana Fanovich. Uh, so this is something to look forward here for next week, Tobago's Natural Resources and Environment. Our speaker today, our host today, sorry, our host today is a very, she's an awesome student, an awesome person. So Alana is our co-host today. She is originally from the Chinese province of Wuhan, Hunan and was raised in Withby, Ontario. She attended high school at Kingsway College, came to Andrews University in 2019 and has been studying biochemistry. We've, we are pleased to have her studying biochemistry uh, with us. She enjoys skateboarding, reading, playing the piano and cello. She has a passion for creative writing um, and she was the editor of a high school's new newspaper and also now serves as editor in chief of the student movement, which is our university's newspaper. She founded the Scriptorium, Scriptorium, a creative writing club here at Andrews in 2020. She writes a column for the Canadian Adventist Messenger. And on the screen there is her first publication, first short story published in the summer of 2022. She hopes to continue um, doing this sort of multi, inter interdisciplinary approach to knowledge and learning um, in the field of science, medicine, and creative writing. Alana, time is yours to introduce. Dr. Evely Shockley is the Zora Neale Hurston Distinguished Professor of English at Rutgers University. Uh, she earned her PhD in English Literature at Duke University, and in 2011, she published the book Renegade Poetics, Black Aesthetics and Formal Innovation in African American Poetry, which explores the poetics of the Black arts movement. Over the years, she has also published numerous poetry collections, including the Hurston Wright Legacy Award-winning book, The New Black, and 2018 Pulitzer Prize finalist, Semi-Automatic. 
Her poetry and essays have been featured in several anthologies. Evie's honors include the Lannan Literary Award for Poetry and the Stephen Henderson Award, as well as the Holmes National Poetry Prize. Her new poetry book, Suddenly We, will be released this March. And just for a taste of her poetry, I'd like to read her prose poem, You Must Walk This Lonesome, from her book, Half Red Sea. And I hope I do it justice. <laughs> Say hello to moon, leads you into trees as thick as folk on Easter pews, dark, venture through amazing, was blind but now fireflies glittering dangling from evergreens like christmas oracles soon you meet the riverbank down by the riverside water baptizes your feet moon bursts back in low yellow swing low sweet chariot of cheese shines in shines on in the river cup hands and sip what never saw inside a piece be still mix your tears Moon distills distress like yours, so nobody knows the trouble it causes. Pull up a log and sit until your empty is full, your straight is wool, your death is yule. Moonshine will do that barter with you what you got for what you need. Draw from the river like it is well with my soul. Oh, moon, you croon, and home you go. Yeah, very nice. And without further ado, it is my honor to welcome the distinguished scholar and poet, Evie Shockley, to Environmental Fridays. Thank you. Oh my goodness, that is such a, a, a delightful way to be introduced. And I feel <laughs> like um, maybe we should just stop there. <laughs> Go home. <laughs> Do you all um, have my slides? Uh, yes. Visible. Yes, senior slides. Okay. Excellent. Um, I, you know, it's it's a, a really a great honor and a delight to to be able to talk with um, people who are invested in the environment about um, African American nature poetry. Um, and I thought about so many different ways that I could approach it and and the the number of poems that I would like to share with you all um, exceeds counting. Um, but I hope I've settled on a kind of an overview of some of the the ways that we think about this um, genre of poetry um, in in my field and. Um, you all will help me articulate the ways that these poems may or may not speak to you. Um, and maybe I can direct you to other things that that you might be interested in that don't fall within this presentation. So um, just with that, I'm going to jump right in. So African-American poets have always written about what we call nature. And we'll talk a little bit about that word um, later on. But we have always, from the beginning, um, written about nature. Um, the first African-American, um, really African-born, enslaved, kidnapped, brought to the US, um, the first um, Black woman he, in this landmass before the US was even the US um, to publish a book of poetry um, was Phyllis Wheatley, um, as she published, she later married and um, became Phyllis Wheatley Peters. Her book um, is filled with images of the natural world. And I thought I would just um, give you um, a little passage from her poem on imagination, um, which was published in that, that aforementioned book in 1773. Though winter frowns to fancy's raptured eyes, the fields may flourish and gay scenes arise. The frozen deeps may break their iron bands and bid their waters murmur o'er the sands. Fair flora may resume her fragrant reign and with her flowery riches deck the plain. Sylvanus may diffuse his honors round and all the forest may with leaves be crowned. Showers may descend and dews their gems disclose, 
and nectar sparkle on the blooming rose. Um, so, you know, here we have a, a young girl writing in her late teens, um, these poems, um, who somehow survived the Middle Passage at the age of six or seven or eight, um, estimated, and still um, found it within herself to, um, after learning English and a little Latin and a little Greek, mm -hmm. um, and reading a lot of uh, 18th century poetry, um, English poetry, um, found it within her to to write um, and sing some of these, these beauties of nature. Um, so why is it then um, that poems by African-Americans have not always been thought of as nature poetry? And I say this um, on the evidence that um, for many, many years, I mean, throughout the 20th century, and um, even into the beginning of the 21st century, if you look at um, anthologies of nature poetry, uh, American nature poetry or English language nature poetry, you will be lucky to find one or, or two Black poets included, if that. I, I have seen anthologies in this vein that do not include a single Black person. So why, why are African-Americans not thought of as writing nature poetry? Well, one reason is that um, people have often associated nature with rural locales or undeveloped wilderness, areas that are in turn um, in the US typically associated with white people. Um, if you think about um, skiing and hiking and camping and you go out into like media and look for images, um, again, until very recently, the images you would see of those kinds of activities would always be um, uh, non-Black people, certainly. Um, and um, that, that kind, that's one of the ways that racism just colors the way we see everything, including the natural world, right? Um, it impacts also the way African-Americans experience um, the natural world themselves. Um, and so um, our poets, um, like African-Americans in general, may themselves associate the natural world with things like um, labor, enslaved or exploitative, African-Americans tied to the land without being able to own the land um, for so much of our history. Um, with danger, um, lynchings would take place in these forests and, and uh, in other natural spaces. With deprivation, um, there are often ways that privatization of um, forests, of plains, of beaches uh, leads to exclusion of Black people. Um, and even when the spaces are public or, you know, sort of um, national parks and, and, and things like that, um, the exclusion comes through those unspoken rules that we, we all know about. Um, and thus, often, um, Black people might associate the natural world with the absence of Black people, um, which is, can also be a, a kind of a a dissuader. Um, I just realized I never I set my timer, so let me do that now. Um, another way to approach this question of why poems by African Americans have not always been thought of as nature poetry has to do with how nature poetry is constructed. Um, it has um, traditionally been defined in relation to European or white American traditions, um, like the pastoral poem, which was originally and a mode of ancient Greek poetry that was taken up again in early modern English poetry by um, Spencer. Um, these poems, the pastoral poems traditionally were featured shepherds um, singing to shepherdesses um, about the beauty, the holiness, the peace of the countryside and rural life. And the country would be 
placed in direct contrast to the ugliness or noise or pollution or corruption of the city and city life. Um, so that's one traditional form of nature poetry. Um, and then um, romanticism, British and American romanticism um, associated with writers like Williams, William Wordsworth, John Keats, um, Thoreau. Um, I'm featuring one of his, his more popular prose, but he was also a poet. Um, and Emily Dickinson, um, writers who celebrated the natural world as a space of sublime beauty and again, spiritual restoration for mankind. Um, the idea was that you you go out into nature for what it can do for you and and your your spirit. And these are um, constructions of nature and the natural world that that come from a, a, a viewpoint and ideology that suggests that the world that that the earth is here for us that we have dominion over it and i'll come back to that um and finally um african-american poetry has not always been thought of as nature poetry um in part because some of the culturally significant and popular black literary movements in the u.s have um actually emphasized black people's movement to and concentration in urban spaces so if you think about um, the Harlem Renaissance, also known as the New Negro Renaissance, and I say I'm emphasizing the New Negro Renaissance because that term, new, the New Negro, um, kind of um, stands for or points towards what that movement um, was driven by, was um, partly was the great migration of um, Black people from what had been the plantations and what were still the... Um, um, the white owned agrarian, um, you know, labor camps and sh sharecropping um, practices that um, black people had been, the majority of black people in the US had been tied to for so many years under slavery and after. Um, they, it, during the early part of the 20th century, uh, began migrating out to from those agrarian spaces to urban spaces urban spaces within the South, but much more urban spaces in the North, the, the Midwest and um, in California to where industrialization was creating the need for um, labor that promised jobs and greater opportunity. Um, we can refer to history to see exactly how that worked out, but that, that movement, um, sort of undergirded an idea of African-Americans becoming modern, moving from a more agrarian and feudal-like life into, into modernity. And so um, Black people themselves were emphasizing their, their urbanity, their sophistication, right? Um, disassociating themselves from the land. And the Black Arts Movement, um, which took place in the 1960s and 70s um, and has had a lingering impact um, on the way that we practice and think about African-American literature, um, especially African-American poetry, that movement, um, cultural and political, was aligned with Black power politics um, and introduced the idea of Black aesthetics, um, which again, um, is a still very powerful concept within uh, Black writing. And Black aesthetics as the Black arts movement um, theorists and practitioners um, were trying to, to, to flesh out that idea. It was very associated with Black speech, Black music, and, and cultural practices of Black people living in uh, what were then and maybe still uh, are called urban um, inner cities um, or ghettos. I think that word is has been retired. Um, but but um, again, it was a very um, city oriented um, style of blackness that was being um, kind of centered in that movement. And um, so all of these things have led 
to African-American poets not being seen as nature poets. Um, enter, um, among other things, uh, this beautiful anthology, Black Nature, Four Centuries of African-American Nature Poetry, which was edited by Camille Dungy, um, a poet herself. Um, Dungy confronted this absence of Black poets in the anthologies um, um, that were interested in environmental or natural um, or ecological poetry and, um, and took it upon herself, um, thank goodness, um, to, to gather a, a whole book and I'll show you um, this is a it's a pretty a pretty thick book. Yes, yes, I love it. Um, just um, po poets from Phyllis Wheatley <laughs> Peters um, to what was then the present in I think it was 2010. Um, black poets writing about nature in all kinds of ways, and um, that book um, I think popularized what some black scholars like Kim Ruffin and others were already uh, working on, which was to think about how to bring out um, what African-American poets have to say about nature in their work and how to make that visible. Um, it's a wonderful anthology. Um, and so what I wanna do is just um, foreground a few ways that African-American poets do celebrate nature in their poetry. Um, but also help to complicate and redefine what nature is. And then um, share some um, some poems. I'm gonna share as many as I can within the, the time <laughs> remaining. Um, <laughs> uh, African-American poets remind us that nature's beauty is varied and complicated. Um, we think about human nature and the things that humans have done and continue to do to one another. Um, as nature poetry in its own way. Um, we think about natural disasters as, uh, you know, there, there are the, 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 the beauties that we associate with the mountains and the beaches and the, the, the lakes and the streams, but there's also Hurricane Katrina. There's also, um, um, you know, the, the, the flooding of the Mississippi uh, in years past that impacts everybody in the area, but often black people bear the brunt of those things. And so our poetry may, um, may take that up. Um, African-American poets question the idea of humans having dominion over the earth, um, in part because black people under chattel slavery were treated as natural resources themselves. Um, it lends itself towards uh, a view that's skeptical of this idea of humans being able to do whatever we want to or need to uh, or feel we need to with the um, the things that that make up the earth, which includes people, of course. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, have a concern for environmental degradation, not so much again as stewards of the land, but as basic housekeeping, um, as doing your part for, um, as a creature among creatures. Um, and I thought that term housekeeping um, is appropriate because as you all will know, ecology, like the word eco-poetics, um, takes the root word eco uh, from the Greek word oikos, which means house, mm. uh, right? Mm. And then um, some African-American poets also destabilize the nature culture binary. Um, the, the idea that we can be outside nature um, is, um, is one that I have come to find um, untenable, right? There is no outside nature, as mm -hmm. Ed Roberson um, has said. So um, with that, I'm just going to share uh, a few poems with you. And um, I think what we can do is use the Q&A period to go back to whichever poems people are interested in talking about um, or asking about. Mm -hmm. So um, Anne Spencer is a poet from the early part of the publishing in the early part of the 20th century. Um, she was famous 
not only um, as one of the first, um, you might say, African-American modernist women poets, but um, also for the garden that she had in the two lots behind her house. She had a big, a multi-room garden um, that is now uh, a historic landmark in Lynchburg, Virginia, in her state, and I think maybe even a national uh, historical site. Um, so here's a poem that she wrote um, called Lines to a Nasturtium. A lover muses. Flame flower, day torch, Mauna Loa. I saw a daring bee today pause and soar into your flaming heart. Then did I hear crisp crinkled laughter as the furies after tore him apart? A bird next, small and humming, looked into your startled depths and fled. Surely some dread sight and dafter than human eyes as mine can see set the stricken airwaves drumming in his flight. Day torch, flame flower, cool hot beauty. I cannot see, I cannot hear your fluty voice lure your loving swain. But I know one other to whom you are in beauty born in vain. Hair like the setting sun, her eyes a rising star. Motion gracious as reeds by Babylon bar all your competing. Hands like, how like, brown lilies sweet. Cloth of gold were fair enough to touch her feet. Ah, how the senses flood at my repeating, as once in her firelit heart, I felt the furies beating, beating. Mm. Um, love this poem for many reasons. Um, she wrote it at a time when uh, Mauna Loa, the volcano uh, in Hawaii, mm -hmm. had recently erupted. So there's this um, marker of uh, its its uh, time of writing that's built right into the poem. Um, and it's interesting to me that the process of bees and hummingbirds pollinating a nasturtium uh, which seems like a very natural and appropriate thing, um, <laughs> turned into this kind of ominous, um, this ominous act. And um, I'm really interested, one of the ways I think about this poem is that this lover who is not um, Spencer herself, this is, uh, I think of it maybe as a, as a male voice who um, himself is uh, interested in um, shall we say, penetrating a, a beautiful woman that he describes in the second stanza. And um, the poem gives us a way to rethink what it means to, to um, imagine women as flowers there to be um, appreciated in whatever way um, somebody might want to, right? So that complicated the beauty of nature, but... Um, um, thinking about it in more complicated ways. Audre Lorde, um, a poet we um, might not associate with nat nature poetry, um, was uh, a wonderful activist um, and writer for feminist um, woman, uh, feminist um, and uh, lesbian and um, black uh issues of all sorts. I mean, she she was um, intersectional before the, the fact, so to speak. Um, she has a wonderful poem that, um, that I think makes a critique of gender through some of the ways that uh, mankind, and I'll say mankind in this instance, um, approaches nature, the bees. In the street outside of school, what the children learn possesses them. Little boys yell as they stone a flock of bees trying to swarm between the lunchroom window and an iron grate. The boys sling furious rocks, smashing the windows. The bees, buzzing anger, buzzing their anger, are slow to attack. Then one boy is stung into quicker destruction 
and the school guards come, long wooden sticks held out before them. They advance upon the hive, beating the almost finished rooms of wax apart, mashing the new tunnels in while fresh honey drips down their broomsticks and the little boy feet becoming expert in destruction trample the remaining and bewildered bees into the earth. Curious and apart, four little girls look on in fascination, learning a secret lesson and trying to understand their own destruction. One girl cries out, hey, the bees weren't making any trouble. And she steps across the feebly buzzing ruins to peer up at the empty grated nook. We could have studied honey making. <laughs> that is pretty cool. <laughs> right? So, um, you know, coexistence is a thing. Right? Um, another poet I uh, love, uh, whose work I really love, is Ross Gay. Um, here he is with um, one of uh, his um, really, really celebrated and um, I think in some ways most nature-oriented books, um, Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude. Um, he comes at the idea of humans in relation to um, other species of um, animal life um, from a different perspective. Becoming a horse. It was dragging my hands along its belly, loosing the bit and wiping the spit from its mouth made me a snatch of grass in the thing's maw, a fly tasting its ear. It was touching my nose to his, made me know the clover's bloom. My wet eye to his made me know the long field's secrets. But it was putting my heart to the horses that made me know the sorrow of horses, mm. the sorrow of a brook creasing a field, the maggot turning in its corpse made me forsake my thumbs for the sheen of unshod hooves. And in this way, drop my torches. And in this way, drop my knives. Hmm. Feel the small song in my chest swell and my coat glisten and twitch and my face grow long. And these words cast off at last for the slow, honest tongue of horses. Mm. Um, so this, in this poem, that kind of violence and um, um, refusal of, of coexistence and of humans' own animal nature is, is cast away um, in favor of seeing, again, us as creatures among creatures and what, what can we learn um, from from other creatures. Um, oh, I have Jericho that. Brown. Hmm? I have his book too. <laughs> well, yeah, Jericho Brown, Pulitzer Prize winning poet, amazing, uh, amazing artist. Um, he um, he uh wrote a poem that it, that's the title poem of this book, uh, The Tradition. He's originally from New Orleans um, as, and lives in uh, Atlanta now, teaches at Emory. And so um, I think of him as a Southern poet who has um, sort of uh, re-embraced um, that part of the country that uh, others were fleeing from earlier in the, in the century or earlier in the 20th century. Um, he has a poem that, um, calls up the the um the complicated way that humans treat one another um i think uh not looking back at slavery but looking at the ways that um black people are still um understood as uh what we might say as some subhuman um less less fully human than than white people um, in this poem that meditates on um, Black Lives Matter movement era uh, events. This is called a tradition 
And so I should say that this is a sonnet. And so in one way, this poem is thinking about the tradition of um, poetry and in another way, um, other kinds of traditions um, that we might question. The tradition, aster, nasturtium, delphinium. We thought fingers in dirt meant it was our dirt. Learning names in heat, in elements classical philosophers said could change us. Stargazer, foxglove. Summer seemed to bloom against the will of the sun, which news reports claimed flamed hotter on this planet than when our dead fathers wiped sweat from their necks. Cosmos, baby's breath. Men like me and my brothers filmed what we planted for proof we existed before too late. Sped the video to see blossoms brought in seconds, colors you expect in poems where the world ends, everything cut down. John Crawford, Eric Garner, Mike Brown. So um, I love the way um, the poem begins with this um, list, this trio of flowers. Um, mm -hmm. some, these are um, the, the, the common names mixed in with, I think, some of the um, Latinate names. Um, and they, they appear throughout the poem in italics, stargazer, foxglove, baby's breath. Um, and to end with this reference to um, the, the cutting down of um, Black men like John Crawford, Eric Garner, and Mike Brown, Michael Brown, um, whose death in Ferguson in some ways really launched the Black Lives Matter movement into a national um, awareness. Um, it makes, it asks us to see them as flowers, as precious, as beautiful, um, and um, and also as, as cut down, right? So um, I think this is another poem that, again, invites us to see um, ourselves and each other as, as part of nature and thus, as part of what we we have to um, recognize as as um, precious, not simply for its beauty, including its beauty for its beauty, but but precious because um, it's fragile and um, once destroyed, some things individually and then species wise and. Um, and beyond that, right, cannot be brought back. Um, a poet who I, I really, really love um, is Ed Roberson. And you heard me uh, quote him earlier um, uh, as saying that there is no outside nature. And he, he and his work really, um, I credit with giving me um, a, a truer understanding of that insight. Um, there's a, a social geographer, um, um, Carolyn Finney, who says, you know, if you're breathing, you're in nature. And um, and that, that idea that because we build structures, um, um, not just out of wood, but, you know, out of other substances that we find or create with what, uh, with the chemicals, um, and compounds and elements that earth gives us, um, that our structures are somehow different than the beaver's structures or the bee's structures or any other structures, right? Um, that that's because we're inside a house or an office building, we're not in nature. Um, Roberson in, uh, has, has many books, um, but this one city eclog is a book that really is centrally directed at this idea destabilizing that idea that nature's over here and culture or the man-made world, the human world is somewhere else, somewhere outside that. And this is a poem that 
um, gets at it very directly. And his syntax, I will uh, just warn you up front, is um, complicated. He thinks of it as kind of double jointed syntax. And so um, phrases kind of unspool backwards and forwards in, in some ways, but you'll you'll see the, the main thrust of what he's what he's getting at. City eclog. Um, eclog was a, a kind of pastoral poetry. City eclog, words for it. Beautifully flowering trees you'd expect should rise from seeds whose fluttering to the ground is the bird's delicate alight or the soft petal stepping its image into the soil. But here come the city's trucks bumping up over the curb, dropping the tight balls of roots in a blueprint out on the actual site in the street. Someone come behind with a shovel will bury. City of words we're not supposed to use, where everyone is lying when it said these words are not accurate, that this shit is not the flowering, that shit off the truck and not the gut bless of bird and animal dropping isn't somehow just as natural a distribution as the wild bloom. The trees are delivered in ordered speech as, <clears throat> as is dirt mouth, curse and graffiti to where the back to perches want them. Bought with the experience that thought up city. The idea of the place tramples up its rich, regenerate head of crazy mud into the mutant's changeling portion. Committee cleanliness and its neat districts for making nice nice and for making sin may separate its pick of celebrant monsters, but which it is now is irrelevant as this numbered street sequence to archival orders of drifting sand. What it will be the stinking flower, the difficult fruit, bitter, complex, the trunk, all on the clock, on the tree rings clock, history's section cross cut, portrait, landscape, it already knows, composts into ours, the grounds for city. Um, so I love this idea, this image of Oh, you think trees um, are the product of, you know, birds um, eating seeds and then um, and then shitting them out, dropping them out um, somewhere else, and they they are just naturally thus fertilized and planted and distributed, and they bloom. And he says it's also natural distribution, or it's just as natural when humans are the ones who pick the seeds and put them somewhere and. Um, and um, spread on the manure. Um, and um, he he really does all this work to sort of um, disrupt this idea that what we're doing is planned and what nature does is natural, it's wild. Um, I love the line um, where he calls um, benches uh, on the street um, backed perches so that, you know, we, where we sit is not that different from where birds choose to sit, right? Um, anyway, there's a lot more I could say about this poem, but I want to, to get um, one, maybe two more in. Um, Marilyn Nelson is a wonderful poet um, who often writes in um, uh, forms, the formal verse like uh, sonnets and rhyming quatrains. Um, but uh, in this particular book, she um, she writes in free verse, but it, uh, uh, she produced an entire book of poetry celebrating the life of George Washington Carver, um, who, as you all know, is a famous um, early uh, American, African-American um, scientist, um, most well known, I think, for um, um, the not so much discovery of the peanut, but of popularizing the many, many things one could do with peanuts. Um, this poem um, in some ways comes full circle. Um, I think this is a, uh, the poem I'm gonna share with you is one in which um, what we have is, is, is really pure celebration. And, and I do love that 
African-American poets linger in that spot sometimes. This is called Ruelia Noctiflora. A colored man come running at me out of the woods last Sunday morning. The junior choir was gonna be singing at Primitive Baptist over in Nat Natasulga, and we were meeting early to practice. I remember wishing I was barefoot in the heavy, cool looking dew. And suddenly this tall, raw wild man come puffing out of the woods shouting, come see, come see. Seemed like my Mary Jane's just stuck to the gravel. Girl, my heart like to abandon ship. Then I saw by the long tin cylinder slung over his shoulder on a leather strap and his hoboish tweed jacket and the flower in his lapel that it was the professor. He said, gesturing his tan eyes ablazing, that last night, walking in the full moonlight, he'd stumbled on a very rare specimen, Ruelia noctiflora, the night blooming wild petunia. Said he suddenly sensed a fragrance and a small white glistening. It was clearly a petunia. The yellow future beckoned from the lip of each tubular flower, a blaring star of frilly tongue-like petals. He'd never seen this species before. As he tried to place it, its flowers gaped wider, catching the moonlight, suffusing the night with its scent. All night he watched it promise silent ecstasy to moths. If we hurried, I could see it before it closed to contemplate the coming seed. Hand in hand, we entered the light spattered morning dark woods. Where he pointed was only a white flower until I saw him seeing it. And I just love this poem. Um, the idea that looking through the eyes of someone who, um, who understands nature, who's studying it, who's, um, who's interested in, um, in it at, at multiple levels, that looking through their eyes can teach you to appreciate even just the simple beauty of it. This poem just slays me every time. Um, and I think if we've got three more minutes, yeah, um, I will just share um, sure. one of my own poems. Um, it's, I was only gonna do this if we had time. So stop me if you want to, to shift no, gear. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, this um, this poem comes from uh, the book New the New Black. Um, I felt like I should just I put two covers because there was no reason to put my face <laughs> that you're looking it's at. The cover for suddenly we okay. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it's on its way into the world. Oh. Uh, so this poem um, I think is maybe in line with the. Um, the Jericho Brown poem in some ways, but it's also very much like Marilyn Nelson's poem, um, celebrating um, some of the things that I love. It's called Where You Are Planted. He's high as a Georgia pine, my father would say, half laughing, southern trees as measure, metaphor, highways lined with kudzu covered southern trees. Fuchsia, lavender, white, light pink, purple, Crepe myrtle bouquets burst open on sturdy branches of skin smooth bark. My favorite southern trees. 100 degrees in the shade. We settle into still pools of humidity, moss dark beneath live oaks. Southern heat makes us grateful for southern trees. The maples in our front yard flew in spring on helicopter wings. In fall, we splashed in colored leaves, but never sought sap from these Southern trees. Frankly, my dear, that's a magnolia, I tell her, fingering the deep green, nearly plastic leaves, amazed how little a Northern girl knows about Southern trees. I've never forgotten the charred bitter fruit of holidays poplars, nor will I. It's part of what makes me Evie. I grew up in the shadow of Southern trees. Thanks. Very nice. Very nice. Yes. Is this what we do? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, um, uh, Alana, do you want to start off our conversation? Questions, comments? Sure. Um, first of all, yeah, no, all those poems were so beautifully written. It was very, it was very cool to take a dive into nature poetry and how that can intersect with, I guess, all facets of humanity. Um, I thought it was interesting how two poets that you read used the flower, the the nasturtium, nasturtium. Yes. 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 Yeah. Um, and that kind of stood out to me because that's not something that's not a word that I hear very often, and I don't know too much about plants. But <laughs> I was I searched it up really quickly, um, and I I found that it symbolizes victory and struggle, which I thought mm -hmm. was very cool. Um, yeah, I think that's one comment that I was thinking about throughout your readings. And yeah, especially the poem where the poet intertwined um, the city and nature uh, and how you were speaking of how kind of where there is life, perhaps there is nature, mm -hmm. um, even if it's not the tip our typical idea of it. And I thought that was really beautiful, too. So those are just some thoughts that I had. Thanks, Anybody yeah. else? Did you want to say something, Professor? Oh, just um, I, um, I I was going to just mention that um, Anne Spencer really loved nasturtiums. She okay. um, she grew them in her garden back there, and um, she went so far as to paint. Um, I think the first stanza of this poem on the wall in her kitchen. Hmm. So like. She was just someone who, who really deeply embraced um, um, her love of, she grew up roaming around the Virginia and West Virginia countryside and and um, she was never as happy as when she was in her garden. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm assuming from your poem, um, the last one you read for us that you are a Southern girl. <laughs> I am. And so we could definitely see how the, the geography of where we were brought up affects our imagery, our poetics and stuff. Do you want to say more about that? Yeah, I think um, Camille Dungy in her introduction to uh, Black Nature talks a lot about that. Um, she uh, grew up in, uh, I want to say, um, California out out west mm -hmm. and um, when she so she was very used to a, a, a landscape that looks entirely different from what um, mm -hmm. I grew up in right um, more desert uh, more you know different different trees all together I remember the first time I went to, to California the eucalyptus you know all these um um, the Joshua tree and just all these these um, things that that don't appear in the U.S. South. Um, and then um, for the, I know a lot of Environmental Fridays listeners are in the Caribbean and mm -hmm. uh, from the Caribbean, and that again is another you know um, uh, very different landscape, and it absolutely shapes the way that you relate to nature. Is water plentiful or is it scarce? Yep. Yeah, you know, um, is are are the colors, you know, sort of technicolor, or are things much um, on a much more sort of muted and nuanced color scale? Um, yeah, she she talked about what it meant to her, and how I think her awareness of um, nature as something more than the backdrop to her life. Mm -hmm. um emerged when she moved to Virginia to the to the same city where Ann Spencer lived in fact uh Lynchburg and and was encountering you know live oaks and uh, very you know very different um a very different landscape mm -hmm. yeah yeah any anyone else 
Hey, Dr. Murray, I have to leave shortly, but I stayed on to say this was so beautiful. This episode is so beautiful, and I cannot wait for it to be recorded and shared on YouTube for others in our community and the world to hear what she had to say, but also to listen to her poetic creativity and how she presented it. And just to know, I tell people this all the time, so many people are not really up on the environment. And I say they are so far behind. And you just doing Environmental Fridays is helping our community and the world. But she brings a sense of beauty and environmentalness to this that's gonna make people, I think, want to know more as though they should already be. But I <laughs> love this episode. And this is why I stayed on, even though I had a 1030. I wanted to stay on to say thank you very much for presenting thank this to you. us. And I cannot wait to share it with the rest of the world and the rest of our community. And for the listeners who couldn't get on, um, you know, they're going to be very pleased um, to hear the recording of this. So thank you very much. So, thank you. So Princess, ironic, ironically, your last uh, publication came out yesterday and we featured a full page of, um, of Carver, at least half a page. And wow. yeah, I never knew about this book of poetry about Carver. Yes. So we'll probably be purchasing that book and uh, including some of that poetry next time. <laughs> oh, it's, and also, yeah, yeah sharing with people to, to connect with that book. So that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think actually the Marilyn Nelson Carver book is in our library. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, and I've also read her book on Emmett Till. Ooh. It kind of made me think about your um we were looking in class yesterday at your poem on frederick Douglass uh, imagined letter to his daughter i was wondering if that poem is part of a group of poems that have other letters from frederick Douglass, or if it's a standalone it's a standalone yeah i like the idea of the title suggesting that um that there was a a, a cache of lost letters some, right. somewhere right um but the idea was to to you know in the sense that the poem is complicating him as a hero you know he's a hero but he's also a human mm -hmm. um there's this idea that there might be other lost letters that there there is much more that we that we don't know about who he was we just have the public persona so but i'm i'm really honored that you're teaching that thank you well i was thinking about like you were saying about the complication of Douglas and his explanation to his daughter about himself as a father and as a husband and and as an a, as a black activist and how to meld those different roles uh, into one human life and the difficulty of that goes right along with what you were saying here about the complications of uh, each of these poets introducing into um distinctions between what is human and what is nature uh being outside the horse and becoming the horse uh, and what those borders are that we sometimes make uh artificial distinctions about for the purposes of understanding and cataloging exactly right i mean what would we have done without linnaeus and yet um you know the these these attempts to classify everything um, are part of the the fabric of the the thinking about the world that allowed um, some people to classify other people mm. as you know uh, somehow distinct in a way that um, that excused uh, abuse and and exploitation and what I love about Ross Gay's poem is that um it not only um dares to to imagine sort of uh a an unmediated relationship with uh the horse which is another um animal that is treated and still is treated as though it is, you know, here for purposes of labor, for doing what humans need, um, need, need it to do. And he, he's, 
he doesn't allow the history of African Americans being treated as um, beasts of labor to prevent him from recognizing kinship, right? Which, um, which is part of you know, which is not something that every poet is willing to to do or has been willing to do. He he leans into that um, communion, and and thus we not only um, understand something different about how we treat other humans, but we understand that we might need to question how we treat horses. Why do we think that they're here for our use? Right. Yeah, the, the my my takeaway or impression from yeah the the horses one stood out to me too, um and the word empathy came to mind, and empathy we use you know in terms of like human relationships, but it seemed to me that not only it seemed to me like he was in a sort of discovery of his own empathy to the horse. Yes. It seemed like as an evolution, not that he started out being empathetic, but right. he he became empathetic and hence becoming a horse. Yes, I really ING. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, a process and, 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 the, it's interesting that the process is through um, um, sort of, it begins with connecting, like physically touch, right? Mm -hmm. And then it becomes this matching nose to nose, eye to right. eye, heart to heart, um, which leads to the, I love the line, made me forsake my thumbs. I mean, this is supposed <laughs> to be a thing along with, um, a particular kind of language that mm -hmm. distinguishes humans from all other animals. And and he's like, you know, maybe the thumb, the opposable thumb is a little overrated. <laughs> 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 maybe that's part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that, that underlies really what you know we try to teach or or you know demonstrate in terms of environmental Fridays is that we are all in this together. Exactly. And um, the environment is us. The environment is part of us. We are part of it. And this um, poem, Becoming a Horse, sort of epitomizes that we are part of each other. Yes. Which is part of one of the fa my favorite poems from U Ulysses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that part that talks about we are a part of each other. I'm losing the words right now, but I think you guys probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Are you talking about Tennyson's Ulysses, where he says, yes. I'm a part of all that I have met? Yeah, that? that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And there's also thank you so much, Professor Shockley, for uh, blessing our learning community with your uh, yeah. visit and your, you know, lecture and your poems. That was just awesome. It was yeah. my pleasure. Thanks for um, lingering with me in language and seeing things through your eyes because it, just the very act of hearing your voice with the poems is different from me or maybe others just reading it you know so yeah just voicing it you hearing your voice help to interpret it in some way oh That's thank different. you it's true that if you read them out loud yourselves yes. um, the meanings bubble up um yes. surface in a in a different way poetry is definitely meant to be heard so That's i really cool. um enjoy sharing them and uh i you might see me back here again um in some future okay. fridays and if yes. not I'll be watching on youtube this is a okay. wonderful series thank you <laughs> yeah, so we much definitely for want to connect with other poets as well so yes this will become a staple at least once a semester or something Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah.
Thank you so very much. Thank you all. Okay. Have a wonderful day and a great weekend. Thank you so much. This was lovely. Thank you. Thanks for the uh, introduction, Alana. It was really uh, moving to hear you uh, read the poem. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. For more information about our sponsors and partners, please visit the Environmental Fridays Partners and Sponsors page. Be sure to visit our website at www.theenvironmentalfridays.com.